Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome you all to the uh, eighth book reading of uh, Ceylon College of Physicians Book Club for the month of November. Uh, first of all, I would like to invite uh, Professor Roshadi Sanayak, uh, the president of Ceylon College of Physicians, to brief about the book club, who are the newcomers for the book club. But I don't see any newcomers, but uh, as a habit, uh, we are doing that. Over to you, sir. I, I hope you can hear me good. Yes, sir, we can. I'm not sure whether you see me, though. Yeah, we can see you. Still oh, see right. <laughs> I can't see myself. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Thank uh, it's it's such a pleasure always to to have a session of the CCP book club. Uh, this takes us uh, in some one. This has taken us into some wondrous places uh, from the beginning. Uh, we've had a very wide range of books being discussed. There are two aspects to it. There's some at times people talk about about a particular book or an author. At times, some speak about how you know they saw that book, uh, how say they saw that book. So all these perspectives are important. I don't know if you remember when we listened to Ashok Ferry, he said, you know, when I write a book, when every time somebody reads a book, they read their own book. Uh, so because we have our own um, understanding of what each book means. So this is a forum where we share all that. And I'm. Uh, it's nice to see some people who've already done book club sessions also, people like Diniti who have done one. So it's, uh, it's really nice. And uh, today we are talking about one of the most important books recent in, written in recent times. Uh, that's George Orwell's Animal Farm, you know, which, is, which was written some time back, but which is relevant to this day itself. Uh, it is my great pleasure and privilege to invite Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka, a friend and a colleague whom I respect and admire immensely, to talk about this book and share his thoughts with us. Oh, to Niranjan. Uh, I will. Uh, I, I want to thank Anushka for not just today, Anushka and Madhuanti, for coordinating the entire book club series over the year. This is going to be the last book club session for this year. So thank you, Anushka and Madhuanti. Uh, and then uh, let's get on. Okay, Niranjan. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sanaka and. Uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, it has been a really interesting year uh, with your presidency at the College of Physicians. And I would like to congratulate you for the immense work that you have done uh, for the specialty as well as the college. And uh, I hope to work uh, closely with the college as well as uh, the many uh, prominent individuals that are involved uh, in the future so that we can uh, uplift our standards better. So, uh, and I think uh, the book is a, is a huge uh, leap forward uh, uh, in our effort to uh, look at patients in a human way or look at our profession in a human way. And uh, whenever I go to a, a bookstore, uh, the novels and the books, uh, usually I get uh, mesmerized and it's like uh, visiting a very old uh, friend and Nilanti knows that and she finds it very difficult to bring out of the bookstores at uh, sometimes. So reading books was my passion and uh, this one book uh, had uh, had a tremendous effect on me uh, and so that I would like to share my thoughts with you. Let me introduce uh, Mr. Eric Arthur Blair, the gentleman who is there in this uh, photograph, uh, who is uh, fondly known as uh, George Orwell born in India in 1903. And uh, this gentleman uh, was actually very instrumental in writing two important books. Uh, one is Animal Farm, the other is 1984, uh, uh, which has it had a tremendous effect on the thinking pattern of people. Um, and uh, actually the Times has uh, named him as the second most uh, prominent author uh, of the recent times uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and regarding humanity, I have my own descriptions. Um, what I think humanity is basically is, is that uh, 
when you look at the Cambridge Book of uh, uh, Dictionary, you say that humanity is being human. Uh, some say that it is being kind and having humane qualities. And uh, some say that humanity is the human uh, civilization as a whole. So we sometimes tend to look at the good side of things, but I think humanity, the first definition would be the one that I would like to go on, being human. So even each individual, we, one of us, each one of us has good and bad in us. And depending on the circumstances, we might act accordingly. And uh, that is why I think we have to identify humanity as it is. And uh, when you look at the, and I go to the next slide, I would like to highlight uh, our president uh, of the College of Physicians, uh, who kindly accepted to deliver the keynote address at the Ratna Prakita Society and Anusha was the academic chair. And uh, it was a brilliant uh, presentation, which was admired by many. And in that, uh, when he wanted to explain about humanity and kindness uh, and civilization, he brought in this example of a 55-year-old female carbon dated and lived 12,500 years ago in a place near Ratnapura. And uh, this patient uh, was brought to him by the, this concept of brought him by the other uh, concept of rheumatologist in Mathura, uh, Dr. Atakoran, which I had uh, the opportunity of listening to him directly while uh, dealing with the CCP sessions, where the patient, uh, this lady, had a 55-year-old lady, had a severe osteoarthritis uh, and uh, had probably had difficulty in walking. And the, the most important question that was discussed was that how did she survive for 55 years? You know that even in the early 1900s in Sri Lanka, the, uh, the lifespan of the average female was about 29 to 30, even in, under the British rule. But this lady has lived for 55 years. And how now this lady was, was a burden to the society anyway because she could walk, probably she was looking after the children. But, but even then, during this period of time, even though she was a burden, this was uh, the patient was, or the person was looked after by the community. And that I think was highlighted as the birth of a civilization. And I completely agree. We uh, human beings, uh, I think were different and we evolved simply because of this nature of not being uh, not being strong, we you know, compared to a rhinoceros or a giraffe or even sometimes a orangutan or a gorilla, we are not strong. We had brains, yes, we have brains and we have the ability to manipulate things by our hands. But I think the most important feature that made who we are today is this togetherness, the ability to live together under a simple uh, structure. And this ability has made us evolve into the who we are today through the uh, the development of uh, when we were hunter gatherers, uh, we had this structure in in place. Then we had the when even in Sri Lanka after the, we have a 200, 2,500 civilization in Sri Lanka, we had a beautiful method of dividing the water from the river. How the how the um, the fish that was taken from the river was. Uh, you know, distributed first among the pregnant and the uh, elderly people and the people who are having children. Like that, we had this mechanism that has been developed throughout the years to our civilization to look after the people who were otherwise compromised. And that was a brilliant method. And in, even in the modern civilization that we have today, the cities, we have these methods where the, the earning people who can, who can compensate our tax and then the people who can't earn and who can't do well are compensated in other ways, like free health and free uh, education, for example, even in Sri Lanka. So there is a beautiful method uh, like that in the human civilization. But now this is a beautiful book. I think uh, Anusha should uh, make a note of uh, Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, which can be another CCP book club topic by a person who is very conversant in genetics, hopefully someone like Dr. Vajri Dissanayaka. But here, what we say is that much as we might were to believe otherwise, right? Universal love and welfare of a species as a whole are concepts that I do not make 
evolutionary sense, because this author argues that even though we, we take ourselves, pride ourselves in uh, universal love and welfare of the species, and that we say that this is a human quality, but in the evolutionary sense, that doesn't make any sense. And he correctly says that any altruistic system, which you put the other person in front of you rather than you, is inherently unstable because it is open to abuse by selfish individuals ready to exploit it. And I think that is a beautiful uh, thing that the, he has uh, said. Any altruistic system, the goodness of other people, the goodness of a person, the goodness of a community, or goodness of a country for that matter, you know, it can be inherently unstable, you know, and it is open to abuse by people. And we may have many, many, many personal experiences. And there are many instances that it has happened, unless I think there are specific mechanisms to prevent this from being happening. I think that Jesus Christ told it as first to never put your pearls in front of pigs. And talking about pigs, I think. I would like to share a dream from a pig by a pig. Right? This pig is called uh, Old Major, uh, which is one of the major characters in the no novel novella. Novella is a long novel. Uh, it's a short, long short story or a short novel, The Animal Farm, uh, which I'll be, you know, going through today. So this dream, now, comrade, what's the nature of this love of ours, life of ours? Let us face it. Our love is miserable laborious and short. We are born, we are given just so much food as will keep the breath of our bodies. And those of us who are capable of it are forced to work to the last atom of our strength. And the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered with hideous cruelty. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he's a, he's a year old. No animal in England is free. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. That is the plain truth. So this uh, um, novella is uh, what we call a type, it's called allegoric novella. That means it, it, it has different levels of meanings, even though in front it looks like a fable and like Aesop's dealing with animals' lives, but actually it deals with another very important intrinsic uh, hidden meaning and it is a, what we call a satirical novel where you use uh, various humor and un, you know the, the things that can be never be accepted uh, in the novel so that you can use it to highlight a message or give a message to it so this novel is taking place in England uh, in a farm called Manor Farm where the unfortunately the uh, the farm animals are under Mr. Jones who is uh, who is who is unfortunately is abusing alcohol and not looking after the animals as they should be, and hence they are neglected. And uh, sometimes he's days he's not uh, looking after the animals, and because of it, the other people who are looking after the animals, the 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 other helping hands, are also very cruel to the animals and not looking after the animals. And hence this old major, a twelve year bull. Uh, who is actually a, a, a prized bow, prized middle white bow uh, uh, in England. Uh, that is why he has not been slaughtered. He has, he has been to many, uh, you know, uh, areas uh, as, a, as a exhibit and, and he has a tremendous respect among the animals. So that is why the uh, he had a dream. But probably he has uh, you know, lived 12 years seen the cruelty, seen the neglect, seen the suffering of the animals, and then he probably, you know, saw a dream or he probably thought that, like Martin Luther King, he probably thought that, okay, I would come out with this so that I can tell the animals what I feel. I have little more to say. I merely repeat, remember, always your duty of enmity towards man and all his ways. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or, even, or has wings is a friend. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Remember this, right? I think it's a very important thing at the end of the novel. In fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. 
Even when you have conquered him, do not adapt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes or drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or touch money or engage in trade. All habits of men are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind, weak or strong, clever or simple. We are all brothers. No animal must ever kill any other animal. All animals are equal. So that's the beauty of this preaching. And that uh, probably would have attracted the attention of the animals where they are treated as equal. And they are now introduced into a common enemy, which is the man. And that, I think it's an in intrinsic deficit that has occurred in the first area of this uh, struggle uh, of this person, because they have identified an individual rather than a mechanism or a system that is corrupt. And hence, they are fighting against individuals rather than a system that is corrupt. And we will, we will see this developing later and how it evolves into uh, a not so uh, beautiful scenario. And we are introduced to three pigs, right? One is the old major, the black one. It's a Berkshire uh, uh, um, um, boar who is there to breed. Uh, give and, uh, and there he's with in the middle. You know, he has, it is said that he has a character. He He's uh, usually a character with a, with a simple, with, with, with little words. Right, and this is what we call snowball. And uh, we, from the name, that we can assume that he's not taken seriously by the other people, but he actually is a vivacious pig who has much to tell and has good intentions. And uh, unfortunately, even though sometimes he might not be able to make it into actions. And then we have the squealer, uh, the last pig here, and uh, that person will come into play uh, later. And I will not talk about those uh, squealer and at that, at that exact time. And Napoleon and mainly Snowball and squealer together, actually taking into what old major said, develops into a certain, dict that, that means a certain philosophy that is named as animalism in this book. Okay, and uh, this is a very important thing. These are the seven commandments of animalism. And at the, at the look of it, they, they are not bad, isn't it? Except whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. So here they have identified that there is an enemy uh, so that they can, should fight, so that they, can get, they should get together. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. No animal shall wear clothes, no animal shall sleep in a bed, no animal shall drink alcohol, no animal shall kill another animal, and all animals are equal. So these are the seven commandments that drive this animal farm from, from the day that uh, Old Major spoke about his dream. And Napoleon, together with Snowball and Squealer, you know, got together with the other pokers. A poker is a pig who is means to be slaughtered in one year, uh, but these pigs together now formulate this animalism and now we can say that you know even though in, even though it said that all animals are equal in the animalism we see that the pigs are now getting the upper hand uh, even though that might be to the good or the betterment of the other people but they are taking the upper hand they are having secret meetings they are talking together developing these agendas and uh, sometimes, you know, when things happen like that, people can, you know, get blown away. So we should remember these because one each one after and each one after the other, we can see how they crumble during the process of this book. And any uh, any aragale or any uh, rebellion has its mollies. Right, so I want to introduce you to Molly. At the beginning, they met with much stupidity and apathy. Some of the animals talked of the duty of loyalty to Mr. Jones, and they referred as a master or made elementary remarks as, Mr. Jones feed us. If he were gone, we should starve to death. Others asked such as questions as, why should we care what happens after we death? If this rebellion is to happen anyway, what is the difference that is made, whether we work it for or not? So any, I think, any uh, change will have to face this initial 
hiccups, isn't it? Right. The stupidest question all, of all was asked by Molly, the white mayor. This white mayor actually has been pulling the cart and has been very fond of humans and he has been she has been uh, feeding sugar uh, uh, she has been uh, fed sugar by the uh, uh, by the uh, humans so will there be any sugar after the rebellion no said so snowball firmly we have no means of making sugar on this farm besides you do not need sugar you will have all oats and hay you want and shall i be allowed to wear ribbons in my name eh? comrade these ribbons that you are so devoted are a badge of slavery you cannot understand that liberty is worth more than ribbons. So now we have in the initial change where we have, so I have a chat. So the, this initial change that is happening in this farm has his resistance in various, various ways. So some say that Mr. Jones, the loyalty to Mr. Jones is there, the master is there. So this, the others say that you know, if it is happening, why should we care? We should allow it to happen. And the third uh, possibly is that there are people who might have benefits from the current thing, might oppose this change as it is. So there are very, some subtle changes uh, or characters that are introduced that will represent many people. And then we have the raven. <laughs> it's called Gnosis. So Moses, basically, even though the pigs are now trying to change how they think, Moses promises them of a sugar candy mountain. So what he says is to the animal is that, yeah, you suffer now, but after that, you will be in the sugar candy mountain where there will be enough of sugar, enough of food, and you will be, be able to graze the mountains without any problem. So now they are giving an afterlife. Uh, after I promise so that, uh, you know, this life, even though you're suffering, you will not have to change this life in life because you will be anyway be rewarded in the afterlife. So there are many, many ravens in any community. And I think even though those two things are there in the system anyway, I think probably the one of the most important negative things that Snowball did during his uh, 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 arrangement is that he tries to change the basic uh, amendments. Now there was a problem when anyone who goes on two legs is a is an enemy. But then the birds had an issue because they were you know they were going on two legs. So to accommodate them, the what snowball the eloquently says is that a bird's wing comrade is an organ of propulsion and not of manipulation. It should therefore be regarded as a leg. The distribution mark of a man is the hand, the instrument which he does all his mischief. Yes, it is very theoretical, it is acceptable, and he has got the point correctly. But now from here onwards, he starts to change the basic phenomena that were there in the, uh, in the amendments. And uh, this says that whatever is there, it's there at the beginning. You know, before we change, I think we have to be a little bit careful because the people, later we will see how Napoleon manipulates this to his advantage. And before long, the animals, even before they think, they get their chance. Because one day, far Farmer Jones was so neglected and the animals were very hungry for two to three days. And then the cows, break into the, the hay store and start eating. And Jones was very angry about it. And then they, he together with the other people comes and try to attack the animals. But the animals with their energy, their anger diverted completely towards Mr. Jones is able to drive out Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, as well as the, the other people out of the, uh, out of the manor farm and this is what we call the cow shed battle of the cow shed uh, doctor and the animals this came suddenly yes uh you can have, you hear me you, no you still have slides i can't see the slides can we see the slides oh from when uh, anushka uh, i can't see the slides okay, there's, there's a problem with me my computer that's all right 
Carry on, sorry. <laughs> you, uh, you, you can see the slides. Sorry, can you see the slides? Sir, you have to answer that. I can't see it. Yeah, we can see. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. That's all right then. Just can't. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, right. So it's called the Battle of the Cow Shed, right? And uh, the first few minutes, the animals could hardly believe in their good fortune. Their act was to gallop in a body right from the boundaries of the farm as though to make quite sure that no human being was hiding anywhere upon it. And they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Joel's hatred strain. So this suddenly has come before they were prepared. Before they were prepared, there was a battle and they have won and now they are in control of the of the farm. The harness room at the end of the stables were broken open. The bits, the nose strings, the dog chain, the cruel knives which Mr. Jones had been used to castrate the pigs and the lambs were all flung down the well. Now they are removing and destroying all the uh, things that were harmful for them. And that reminds me about the thought, them about the torture that they have undergone, the rains, the, the things that they have made to control the other people and halters and blinkers, degrading nose bags were thrown out of the rubbish to onto the rubbish fire, which was burning in the yard. So were the whips. All animals camp capered with joy when they saw the whips going into flames. We can we should remember this. Whips going into flames. Whip were a you know a mechanism of control. So they were happy about that. And we see later how it changes. Snowball also three the fire to the fire the ribbons which the horses manes and tails were usually decorated on the market days so now we see that they have won the battle and they are destroying slowly the things that they were the, the mr jones used to harm them thinking that they will never happen again and it will never happen again so anyone will not be able to use them then the day after the reality comes in they walk at dawn as usual, this, and suddenly remembering the glorious thing that has happened, they all raised out into the pasture together. A little way down the pasture, there was a knoll that commanded a view of most of the farm. The animals rushed to the top of the gate and it and gazed around them in the clear morning light. Yes, it was theirs. Everything that they could see was theirs. In the ecstasy of that thought, they gambled around and round and they hurled themselves into the air in great leaps of excitement. They rolled in the dew. They cropped mouthfuls of sweet summer grass. They kicked up clouds and back earth, stuffed it rich sand. Then they made a tour of inspection of the whole farm, surveyed the speechless admiration, surveyed with speechless admiration the plowland, the hayfield, the orchard, the pool, the spiny. It was though they had never seen these things before. And even now they could hardly believe that it was all their own. So now they see everything in their own light. They have chased out Mr. Jones. This now they feel that belongs to them and them only. And they enjoy this, feel, this feeling of independence, feeling of triumph uh, in a beautiful way. And it is beautifully explained and it's it beautifully written by uh, the George Orwell himself. But now they face the reality. Now, the cows were not actually milked during the last two or three days, and hence they had congested udders. And because of that, you know, the pig secretly has trade in everything. So they could actually, you know, get the milk out from the cows. And uh, there was about five or six large. Uh, pool, you know, buckets of milk. And now the question was, what is going to happen to all that milk, said someone. Jones used sometimes to mix something of it in our mash, said one of the hens. So Jones actually has used this milk to the benefit of some of the hens. But now what has happened? Never mind the milk, comrades, cried Napoleon, placing himself in front of the buckets. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important, comrade. Snowball will lead the way. I shall follow you in few minutes. Forward, comrades, the hay is waiting. So in reality, now they are planning for a harvest, right? And the cows were milked. But Napoleon is, you know, just trying to push them towards the harvesting while trying to 
keep the milk in and you will see what is happening to the milk. So the animals dropped down to the hay field to begin the harvest. And when they came back in the evening, it was noticed that the milk had disappeared. So a similar story in most of the things. So milk was not there to be seen in the evening. And we will see what happens to it. And, uh, you know, probably the animals were upset. The, the milk was there. It belongs to all of them. And suddenly, even, uh, you know, the, the milk was not there. So probably after harvesting, after a hard day of harvesting, the animals would have been upset, isn't it? But now we, we are introduced to Screeler, a person who, can, who is said to turn black into white or probably man into female. So comrades, he cried. You do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness. So because later they knew that this milk was used by the pigs. And now to subside this commotion among the animals, now Squealer comes with a beautiful story. Many of us actually dislike milk and apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole object is taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, this has proven by science comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary for well-being of a pig. We pigs are the brain workers. The whole management and the organization of this farm depends on us day and night. We are watching uh, over your welfare. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat that apples. Soon after the struggle and the battle, Two or three days, within two or three days, we see these changes that are happening. And now we see there is a justifiable mechanism that is bringing into force in the form of squealer. And uh, we can have many, many imaginations what squealer represents. Do you know what would happen if pigs fail our duty? Jones would come back. Yes, Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, cried squealer almost pleadingly, skipping from side to side, whisking his tails. Surely there is no one among you who wants Jones back? And that question is a very important question. Keeping the fear in the animal society and taking the rewards that they sometimes have not been justifiably gained. Now, if there was one thing that the animals were completely certain of, it was that they didn't want Jones back. When it was put to them in this light, they had no more to say. So we can understand the plight of the animal. That is one way. So we have the squealer, we have the Napoleon, and we have a certain breed of people who use the, the, uh, the, the spills or the, the benefits of all the other people to their benefit. And now we have specific individuals, characters that come into play, the cat. The behavior for the cat was somewhat peculiar. It was soon noticed that when there was work to be done, the cat could never be found. She would vanish for hours on end and then reappear at meal times so or in the evening after work was over as though nothing has happened. But she always made such excellent excuses purred so affectionately that it was impossible not to believe in her good intentions. So, you know, not in, a, not in this one, but probably, uh, uh, I think probably we, we see these personalities, probably in our wards, you know, in our departments, in our communities, right? So, you know, you might name some cats, right? So the cat joined, but, you know, now the, the snowball was actually forming several committees for the benefit of other, other uh, individuals, right? So one such committee was the re-education committee where the main aim was to um, educate uh, the wild animals, mainly the birds and the shrews and the uh, you know, rats uh, about uh, the, the animalism. So, but the cat joined this re-education committee and was very active for it some days. She was seen one day sitting on a roof and talking to some sparrows who were just out of her reach. She was telling them that all animals were now comrades and they can, that any sparrow who should, who should, could come and perch on her bow. But sparrows, 
kept their distance. How humor has been used uh, beautifully by George Orwell to bring this character into life and to remind us of many, many cats in our lives as well. Then comes a very important thing, the educating of the young. So we saw that there was, there was Napoleon who stole the milk for their benefit. We hope had Squealer who justified everything. We had cats who had who used the opportunity without any work, but for their benefit only. And now we come into Snowball, who actually probably had some genuine concerns about the, the farm. So Napoleon, uh, the Snowball wanted to educate the young so that the young will be, you know, they, they will know animalism. They will know what why it happened. So and they he wanted actually to teach people to read and write. Some were ignorant, some they didn't go along to read and write, but some, most of them wanted to read and write, but some didn't have the capacity to learn to read and write. So Snowball tried to educate the young, but Napoleon, now it is a very important thing, no interest in Snowball's committees. He said that education of the young was more important than anything that could be done for those who were already grown up. So here, now, in the snowball's very uh, theory, he wanted to educate the young and the old together. But in Napoleon, he wanted to, within brackets, educate the young only. Young who have not seen what has been going on. The young who have been newly born, they have not seen what has been happening and the, the early things that has happened. And who were they before this? But, yep, now... Look at the young that Napoleon tries to look after. It happened that Jesse and Bluebell, these are the two sheep dogs, the sheep dogs had both whelped soon after the hay harvest, giving birth with them nine sturdy puppies. As soon as they weaned, Napoleon took them away from their mother, saying that he would make himself responsible for their education. He took them up to a loft, which only could be reached by a ladder from the harness room and kept them from other in such seclusion that the rest of the farm soon forgot their existence. So this young that Napoleon wanted to train or teach mainly were nine dogs or puppies that he trained alone without exposing to the others. And while Snowball were educating the other young as well as the other people uh, about uh, how the animal farm should run. But we will see what happens later. And then you can see that the, uh, here we have a healthy, within brackets, democratic system where Snowball and Napoleon has two different ideas about what should be done. And there would be def def definitely debates and votes. He talked learnedly, this is Snowball, field drain, silage, basic slag and had worked out complicated schemes for all the animals to drop their dung directly into the field at a different stop. Napoleon, on the other hand, produced no such schemes of his own, but said quietly that Snowball would come to nothing and seems to be biding his time. This is a very, very important observation that is there. While Snowball was trying to develop certain things in the farm to the benefit of the others, Napoleon was just rubbishing it and was simply seen biding for time. Animals formed themselves into two fractions under the slogan. This is because of a windmill. They wanted to build a windmill so that there will be electricity and when you have electricity, there will be power so that animals can be rested to certain days. And that is uh, the picture shows you the, how Snowball is scheming to uh, build this complicated windmill. And there, here lies the first important division among Napoleon and Snowball, where animals were divided, vote for Snowball and the three days a week and vote for Napoleon and the full manger. And Benjamin was the only animal who did not side with either fraction. He refused to believe either that food would come or plentiful or that the windmill would save work. Benjamin is a donkey and you know that donkeys have a very, very, very long life. Right. And other than most of the animals that are there, about maximum would have 12 to 14 years, donkeys will have a lot of age behind them. And he has seen many, many things, probably many, many rebellions. Right. But and he is basically very, very, you know, balanced about it. He's very non-interested about it. Windmill or no windmill, he said, life would go on as it is. 
and always gone, that is badly. So that was the interpretation of uh, Benjamin, the donkey. In a certain way, in certain areas, he might be correct. But if all were like this, there will be never having, we never have a change. Right. Now, the dilemma the animals faced, whether to go with Napoleon, whether to go with Snowball. The animals listened first to Napoleon and then to Snowball and could not make up their minds which was right. Indeed, they always found themselves in agreement with the one who was speaking at the moment. Do we remind ourselves of anything uh, that is similar that is happening? I think we can remind ourselves of many, many instances, especially when a population like these animals, you know, they have not had the opportunity to learn, to think for themselves, uh, when they don't have the opportunity to read about things. And then what have happened is the person who speaks grabs their mind and that's where the vote will swing. I think uh, it is really nice uh, to see these things. But what happens now? They'll look at the dogs. He said very quietly that he's Napoleon was nonsense and he advised nobody to vote for it, promptly sat down again. He had spoken for barely 30 seconds and seemed almost indifferent as to the effect he produced. So he didn't want to speak to the people or the animals for that matter, because he was indifferent about their views and their voices. At this snowbank, Frank sprang to his feet and shouting down to the sheep who has begun to belating began belating again, broke into a passionate appeal in favor of the wind well. Now this sheep group, which is actually uh, uh, was, uh, you know, you know, the Napoleon has two main uh, things. One is the dog that he has trained and other ones are the sheep. Sheep cannot understand anything according to George Orwell's novel. You know, they can only say two legs bad, four legs good. And, uh, and other than that, they can't think about for themselves that anything. So whatever Napoleon says or whatever other people says, they just think for themselves like that. And they can make a noise. They usually make a noise. And you, they continue to make a noise. And sometimes they disrupt uh, with noises that are non unintelligent when there is a thing that is bringing on. And this is what the sheep are there for. And whenever Snowball starts to speak, these speaks, the, the sheep will start to disrupt things. And you can have many, many, many uh, similar things comes into your mind, right? Uh, so until now, the animals has been about equally divided in their sympathies. But in a moment, small, Snowball's eloquence has carried them away. In glowing sentences, he painted a picture animal farm as it might be when sordid labor was lifted from animals back. His um, imagination now run far beyond shaft cutters, turnip slicers. Electricity, he said, could operate threshing machines, plows, harrows, rollers, reap, reapers, binders, besides supplying every store with own electric light, hot and cold water and electric heater. By the time he has finished speaking, there was no doubt as to which way the vote would go, right? And so he was able to get the majority's attention. But at that this moment, Napoleon stood up, casting a peculiar sidelong look at Snowball, uttered a high-pitched whimper of a kind no one has ever heard him utter before. So they, he knew that whatever the things that he had done, he will, he will not be getting his way, but he had a backup. At this, there was a terrible baying sound outside. The nine enormous dogs wearing brass studded collars came bounding into the barn. They dashed straight for Snowball, who only sprang from his place just in time to escape their snapping jaws. Because these dogs have never seen Snowball, never been introduced to Snowball. They only knew Napoleon as their master. In a moment, he was out of the door and they were after him. Too amazed and frightened to speak, all the animals crowded through the door to watch the chase. Snowball was running across long pasture and led to the road. He was running as only a pig can run. And poor Snowball was up against a huge, large nine dogs. 
one of them all but closed his jaws of Snowball's tail, but Snowball whisked it free just in time. Then he put on an extra spurt and within the inches of despair, slipped through a hole in the hedge and was seen no more. So the only opponent that Napoleon had has been chased away. And the dogs kept close to Napoleon. It was no noticed that they wagged their tails to him in the same way as the other dogs had been used to do to Mr. Jones. And we can see a similar tragedy now it is coming on. Napoleon with the dogs following him, now mounted on the race portion of the floor where old Major had previously stood to deliver his speech. After banishing Snowball into the wilderness, now he speaks. Sunday meeting, meetings would come to an end. Now the animal farm usually on Sundays had a meeting and they ended it by a beautiful song called the uh, Beast of England. Then it, you know, it nurtured their togetherness. So now Napoleon says that they were unnecessary. It wasted time in all future, in future all questions relating to the work of the farm would be settled by a special committee of pigs presided over by himself. So, uh, you know, other, you know, instead of taking a conclusive you know, opinion from others, debating it and having a vote, now he's going into this mode. These would meet in private afterwards, communicate their decision to the others. So the others have no uh, right in the decision process and uh, they will only have to bear obeying the, uh, the master and there will be no more debates. So we can identify two evils here used by uh, Napoleon actually and eloquently described by George Orwell. The dogs on one hand, whenever Napoleon is threatened or whenever there is a, a thing that is against uh, his view, the, uh, the, the, the dog suddenly growls and the pigs will fall silent. There were four pigs actually, which stood against the uh, banishing of uh, Snowball, but they were silent and they were made silent by these dogs. And then as soon as this commotion settles, the, the, the sheep, the ignorant sheep uh, who has no mind of their own starts belating four legs good and two legs bad. And it co continues and it continues and it continues so that there would be no other voice that can be heard. So one fear to ignorance is causing this problem. But there were rebellions of the hens, right? Because these hens were made to lay eggs and to, you know, donate these eggs rather than make, you know, allowing into allowing them to hatch. Because this the farm now needed money uh, to buy certain things for the for the benefit of the pigs. So first such rebellion has occurred after the rebellion uh, that the animals took over. So. Led by three young black couplets, the head made a determined effort to thwart Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up into the rafters and there lay their eggs, which smash into pieces on the floor. So what they did was rather than giving the eggs, they protested by smashing the eggs into the floor. But Napoleon acted swiftly. He ordered hence rations to be stopped decreed that any animal, animal given such much as a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. The dogs ordered that these orders were carried out. The five days the hen, hens held out, then they capitulated and went back to their nesting boxes. Nine hens has died in the meantime. Their bodies were buried in the orchard and it was given out that they had died of coccidiosis, not due to anything, but due to coccidiosis. And you can, you know, you can understand the irony. Wimper heard nothing of this affair and the eggs were duly delivered. A grocer's van driving up to the farm once a week to take them away. And now you can see the change in the animal farm. The rebellions are crushed uh, with the use of the dogs. And uh, in the process, even though in the commandments, it is said that you should never kill another animal, we see 
killing of animals, even though they are attributed to natural causes in this world. Now comes Squealer to make things better. A most terrible thing has been discovered. Snowball has sold himself for Pedrick of Pinchfield Farm. Pedrick is another farmer which is living by nearby in, uh, in near the manor farm, who is even now plotting to attack us and take our farm away from us. Snowball is to act as his guide when the attacks begin. Now we can see that all the things that are negative are being stuck on Snowball. But we, we thought that Snowball's rebellion was caused simply by his vanity and ambition, but we were wrong, comrades. Do you know what the real reason was? Snowball was in league with Mr. Jones from the very start. He was Jones' secret agent. It has all been proved by documents he left behind, which we have only just now discovered. <laughs> to my mind, this explains a great deal, comrades. Did we not see for ourselves how he attempted to get us defeated and destroyed in the Battle of Kaushet. Now, in the Battle of Kaushet, actually, Snowball was wounded severely and he was awarded a medal, Bravery of Animals, first degree, the Medal of Bravery, first degree. But now things are being used against him. And when, when it was said, because some of these animals have seen the Battle of Kaushet, they have questioned him about this. But it is said that Boxer is one of the main uh, main animals that were, that was there who was pulling the uh, pulling a lot of uh, heavy work for the for the, for the for the farm, and when he questioned, Squealer said that it is said by Comrade Napoleon, and then Boxer, unfortunately, even though he's a hard worker who can't think about itself, he says that if Comrade Napoleon says it must be right, and he forgets everything, right? and this goes into a surge of massacring and animals are massacred first the four pigs who were just you know started to protest were brought in front and asked to confess and they are killed by the dogs and then the three hens the ringleaders who attempted, attempted the rebellion are killed and then a goose who said to you know you know, uh, you know, you get the corn from last year's harvest is killed, and then a sheep, sheep, two sheep are killed because for you know chasing a Napoleon uh, uh, confident uh, a, a, a sheep around so that he has died. So you can see that, and so the tale of confessions, confessions and ex executions went on until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet and the air was heavy with smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the expulsion of Jones. So animals have been slaughtered. Somehow it seems as though the farm has grown richer but while the animals are suffering, the normal animals are suffering, the farm is said to be growing richer without making the animals themselves any richer, except of course the pigs and the dogs. Perhaps this was partly because there were so many pigs and it is said that Napoleon has fathered 147 piglets during the last year and so many dogs. It was not that these creatures did not work after their fashion, that there was, as Creeler was never tired of explaining the endless work in the supervision and the organization of the farm. Much of this work was kind of that yeah. the animals were too ignorant to understand. For example, Creeler told them they had to expend enormous labors every day upon mysterious things called reports, minutes, and memoranda, and thinking that some people might want to have a look at it. See what has happened, what is happening. There were leads of paper which had to be closely covered in writing. And as soon as they are covered, they were burned in the ferns. So the any evidence of their so-called hard labor is burned in the ferns. You can see the irony again here. Neither the pigs nor dogs produce any food with their own labor. And there were very, very, there were very many of them, and their appetites were always good. Right. As for the others, so far as they knew, it has always been they were generally hungry. They slept on straw. They drank from food. <clears throat> they labored in the field. In the winter, 
they were troubled by the cold and in summer by flies. Sometimes older ones among them rack their dim memories and try to determine whether in the early days of rebellion, when John's expulsion was still recent, things had been better or worse than now. So time has passed, generations have died, and there is new people here. They were not taught about the rebellion, the Kaushet, the Battle of the Kaushet, the Battle of the Windmill. So they were oblivious to the changes that had happened, and they are accepting things as they are. Even the ones who remembered sometimes are not sure whether things were better or worse when Jones was still there. And there was nothing with which they could compare their present life. They had nothing to go upon except Squealer's list of figures, which invariably demonstrated that everything was getting better. Figuratively, it was getting better, but the feeling that the true feeling was that they were not getting any better. They were suffering. Animals found the problem insoluble in any case. They had little time to speculate on that such things now. Only old Benjamin professed to remember every detail of his long life and to know that things never had been or ever would be much or better or worse, much better or worse, hunger, hardship, and disappointment being, so she said, the unalterable law of life. Now, the final part of the pigs. And finally, there was a tremendous baying of dogs and a shrill crowing from the back of the cockerel. And out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright. Remember, in the commandments, two legs were bad. But now, Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting hoarts, haughty glances from side to side with his dogs jumbling around him and with his favorite so here, uh, dressed in Mrs. Jones' uh, dress. He carried a whip in his trotter now, right? There was deadly silence. Amazed, terrified, huddling together, the animals watched the long line of pigs march slowly around the yard. It was as though the world has turned upside down. Then came, there came the moment when the first shock had worn off and when in spite of everything in spite of their terror of the dogs and of the habit developed through the long years of the never complaining, never criticizing, no matter what happened, they might have uttered some word of process because it was too much for the, for the other animals to see. So probably in spite of being brainwashed and uh, not remembering things and the terror of the dogs, they would have some uttered some disbelief when of the what he, they were seeing pigs walking on two legs. Napoleon now dressed with his soul as well. But just at that moment, as though at a signal, all sheep burst into tremendous bleating, bleating of four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better. So the sheep now have started bleating out and any thing that has happened in the minds of the uh, the animals any sounds that in you know it emanating, emanating, emanating from their mouths in protest were as usual clouded by these sheep and at the end there was a party in the in uh, Mr. Manners' house, which is now uh, the pig's uh, home. And uh, in that farm, Napoleon says that it is now not an animal farm. He goes back to renaming it as the Menno farm. And they're drinking alcohol, playing cards inside. And you can see the poor creatures watching from the window about this. And the creatures outside looked from pig to man and man to pig and from pig to man again. But already it was impossible to say which was which. And it is dated November 1943 and February 1944. And this book was published in 1945. Earlier, George Orwell had the difficulty in publishing this book, but after getting it published, it had been a very, very uh, important book. 
And unfortunately, he died four or five years later due to tuberculosis at the age of uh, 45. So this is the end of Animal Farm. And uh, this slide, for once, Benjamin consented to break his rule and he read out to her what was written on the wall. So the, the nine, seven commandments that were written in the wall were changed from time to time and time to time. There was nothing there now expect except a single commandment. In the commandments now, there lies only one commandment. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than the others. And I rest my case, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ranjan Desanayake, for that wonderful talk. And uh, I was wondering how closely resemble uh, this animal, the book Animal Farms, to our politics right now. Uh, so I think the audience might have a lot of questions and a lot of things to discuss. Uh, the, the, this forum is uh, open for discussion now. If anyone has any comment, uh, this is your time. Uh, Ranjan, thank you very much. It was an absolutely stunning presentation. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, it was 19, written in the 1930s, wasn't it, Ranjan? Was it uh, in the 1930s that it was originally? Yeah. At, uh, anyway, what uh, he probably. Published in 19, yeah, published in. Yeah. Published in 1945, actually, he had to, uh, you know, he had to go from place to place to uh, place to place uh, to get this uh, work published. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not published before. But after some time, uh, it was accepted, I think, uh, and uh, he was able to publish it. I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether he published it himself, but I'm not. Uh, so uh, that is a story that uh, is written, uh, given. So. Maybe some of the things which happened in the Soviet uh, revolution would have been fresh in his mind at the time that he wrote. I think that may have provided the background, but as you very correctly say, you know, nearly, I don't know, eight years or whatever after we keep reliving it. And uh, mm -hmm. you had you had actually named this Aragale and beyond in the initial when you wrote somewhere. So I think that's absolutely... I mean, not just Aragali, just about after every general, every election, we go through the same process, you know, and we have the squealers also, you know, we have yes. the squealers, uh, we have everything. Yes. And the educating the young, I mean, you know, that that is what we are struggling with in the universities and all that all the time. <laughs> to catch them young, make sure that, you know, the political philosophy is, is ingrained and no one can think for themselves. Uh, and all that. So I think you've related this beautifully. I'll, I'll, we'll, let's wait for other people's comments. I mean, I just wanted to say uh, this probably when he wrote this, uh, like like 1984, that uh, what was happening in Russia may have been playing on his mind, but it is perennially, it's applicable to every day. Let's wait yeah. for the other people's comments. Um, so, uh, until the, uh, you know, what I really wanted was, you know, when you look at the, uh, the uh, description about animal farms in, uh, in, in, in the internet and in, in, the, in the critical reviews, as you correctly said, uh, there are many, many people who, uh, you know, try to uh, say that this is what uh, the, the, uh, the George Orwell wanted to, you know, look at the Soviet revolution uh, happened in the, the 19th, uh, early 19th century uh, and uh, to what has actually happened to the population of the Soviet Union. But what I think is that, you know, this, uh, these scenarios that are there in, in the book, uh, you know, it happens in each and every institution, each and every community. So be it, as I, as I said, it can be a hospital, it can be a ward, it can be a department, it can be a, a, a country, it can be a collection of countries, uh, you know, like the United Nations uh, uh, or the BRICS or anything like that, or it can be, uh, you know, 
you know so it can be an individual as well so even you know this this scenarios uh, this uh, uh, you know, I, I started by uh, admiring the humanity of looking after people and looking after the weak and uh, letting them flourish uh, without uh, allowing them to uh, suffer. Uh, so, but unfortunately, so for that, we have to have a certain system in place. Uh, so that system is made about by the various policies and later politics. So, but unfortunately, some some of these mechanisms can be grabbed as that's why i put the final slide like this richard dawkins the selfish gene any altruistic altruistic system is inherently unstable and it is open to abuse by selfish individuals and if you don't appreciate that uh, fact uh, at least by the learned people if you just see everything with glasses like red green or blue and you can do unless you remove that glasses and see what it is for what it is, uh, whoever it is doing, I think then there will be so many people who will be educated enough and who will be strong enough to protest at the first sighting of deviation from the what is accepted. So that is what I wanted to highlight uh, here uh, the, by you know discussing this book. So what you mean is we all have a responsibility when we are promoting an altruistic system uh, to yes. raise protest the moment selfish individuals start manipulating that. That's that's exactly what we should do. And for that, I think you should uh, come out of our you know you know the loyalties, and uh, it should be a genuine protest. Uh, so. In any any uh, in anything in any establishment, I think uh, that should be the way that things should be done. Uh, so then, the the primary aims of the that institution or that uh, organization will not be diluted and uh, not be able to be hijacked by individuals who has other personal agendas. Another interesting thing, Ranjan, to me was of course now the sheep sheep. We know what sheep generally do, but uh, Orwell picks the biggest, the really intelligent set of intelligent and educated set of animals in the farm. Now, I had never considered pigs to be all yes. that in, in a community till I read this book. So, what, what do you think about that? I mean, why, why pigs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, when when George Orwell actually George Orwell started to write this book, it said that he he has seen a small boy whipping a horse, a large horse, and uh, you know George Orwell probably has thought that you know if the horse knew the energy that he had and the ability that he had. Uh, you know he will not be manipulated by the small boy, isn't it? So that is. Uh, that is said to be one thing that he has in mind when we wrote uh, Animal Farm. Now here, why the pigs were uh, used is that well, we had to, he had to use a farm animal anyway. And, uh, you know, shrewdness uh, in the Aesop's fables, uh, the fox was the one that was used, but we couldn't use uh, the fox here. And uh, probably, I think uh, the pig was the best animal because cows, uh, sheep, uh, horses, and other animals were known to be a little bit of dumber. And uh, the pigs were there and uh, they were sometimes considered dirty and sometimes you know, considered as shrewd. So probably that is why they took pigs as the, uh, the, the, the symbol to uh, represent uh, uh, these type of uh, people. Okay. Uh, in the absence of any other comments, uh, shall we stop the finish the uh, eight book club? Uh, remember uh, of CCP uh, for the for the evening. Uh, anyone else want to talk about anything? Okay, okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Narendra. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, for kindly uh, accepting uh, our invitation to talk to us today on this. Uh, and I think it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant talk. Uh, thank you very much.
and I think there are some comments in the chat box. Uh, I can read later. Uh, Okay, uh, I think Dr. Raghunathan has said something. What Neranjan tried to uh, drive home is strikingly clear. There, uh, there is lots of similarities in our country. Thank you, Neranjan. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of other comments you can read. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Neranjan, again. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. I can see uh, uh, some of the consultants in Ratnapura too are joining, uh, have, have joined. Uh, uh, for the evening today uh, and because they saw what uh, Dr. Naranjan had been like a leader in Ratnapur Clinical Society. Uh, so, okay. Uh, thank you very much again. Have a great evening, you all. Right. Thank you very much, Anushka. And uh, have a pleasant day. And uh, again, thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Right. Bye. Thank you, Naranjan. It was such a great pleasure listening to you. Thank you so much.